what I'd like to do, I want to start off with um, uh, finishing up what I started last week. And I, I feel that it's really important that um, uh, you have a chance to hear what I shared with you, not simply from the lips of a Palestinian saying it, but from the lips of an Israeli. And so um, what I, I'd like to show you for the first half of our time is a video by Ilan Pape, who's a, a professor. Uh, he was a professor for two decades at the uh, University of Haifa. And then most recently, he's a, a professor of social sciences and, and, and international studies at Exeter University in England. So I just want to invite you, if you feel that what you heard today is, again, um, uh, different than what you may have known about or, or what you feel strongly about, I invite you again to consider not feeling, not going with the temptation to pick a side. Okay, what we're doing here is not uh, promoting the, the Israeli side versus the Palestinian side. What we're just trying to do is to understand what, what the facts are so that we can uh, come with a, a productive idea as to what we can do uh, to solve this mess. So uh, next week we'll, we'll spend the whole time just talking about what would it look like practically for us to make a difference uh, and for us to, uh, to solve this and, and, and for our leaders. What would a solution look like? Uh, so I don't have all the answers, but that's something we'll, we'll explore. So uh, what I wanted to do today uh, for the rest of the time, that clock is five minutes fast, so please don't, it's actually seven minutes fast. So if you're looking at it and trying to go pick up your kids, just know that it's, it'll have to be seven after when it's time to go pick them up. So please uh, remain with me. I'm a good uh, keeper of time. So, so I came to the U.S. when I was 19. This was um, in uh, 1996. And uh, my, uh, I came to Al Birmingham, Alabama. And so uh, I, I walk on campus, and in the, in the next two days, I meet this other Palestinian Christian on campus. And believe it or not, he is also the son of an Episcopal priest <laughs> from Jordan. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously our parents knew one another and all this good stuff. So we become really good friends, and uh, he uh, tells me the story that I just love to tell. Um, and that's that on, on his second or third day there, he was one year ahead of me, so a year earlier, uh, a kid at the school had walked up to him and said to him, um, are you, you're, you're the Palestinian on campus, aren't you? <laughs> and uh, my friend is like, yes. <laughs> and the guy goes, your people are terrorists, just right up to his face. Now, do you know those moments where someone says something to you and only after you leave them, you think of what you should have said, right? So this is, the reason this is a classic is because uh, he, on the spot, just had the perfect response for this guy. He goes, you're right. What room were you in again? <laughs> so, picking up with my friend, um, grew up in the church his whole life but had not, uh, had, had kind of decided to move away once he got to college. And, and he didn't have any room for religion much in his life anymore. As opposed to me, who when I made that decision, I decided that I would try a more relevant type of church. Something that, maybe not the Episcopal Church at the time, but something that spoke to me more. So I started going to Southern Baptist churches and non-denominational churches. So one day, Tannery, who's a friend of mine at this point, this is our freshman year, Says to me, Siri, there's this church I've been going to. And, and like, you know, we joke around, and she didn't know the difference between Palestinian and Pakistani back then. <laughs> which is not necessarily true. And, and because, anyway, so, so she, uh, she invites me to come to this church with her, and I invite this guy, my friend, to come with me. His name is Fadi. And I said to Fadi, I said to him, um, uh, why don't you come? Look, you've been, you've been wondering whether you're going to go back to church or not. And I'm really hoping this guy will come to church with me and go, you know, this is relevant, I, I like this, you know. So I went to this church, and we're sitting in the front row, me and this other Palestinian, and Tanner. And uh, the pastor's on the stage, there's about 3,000 people in this mega church, and it's just a huge auditorium, and the guy's stomping on the, on the stage, he's just talking about Jesus, and, and then he's talking about uh, uh, a story in the Old Testament, and, and about the Philistines fighting against the Israelites. Okay, and he stops, and he's talking, and he stops, and he goes, 
by the way, and in the story it was really clear that the Philistines, God's hand was against the Philistines and, and the Israelites were going to win because God favored them. And he stops and he says, by the way, do you know who the modern day descendants of the Philistines are? <laughs> They sound, they sound similar, the Philistine and Palestinian, but the Philistines, if you know, were of Greek origin. The Palestinians were the indigenous people. So we said, it's the Palestinians. And, and he's stomping around, and I'm just like, oh no. <laughs> All I can think about is the guy sitting next to me, you know? And, and he goes, and by the way, it'll be over my dead body that Israel will give up one inch of the land to the Palestinians, because in the Bible today, it, you see that in the same way that God's hand is against the Philistines and, and, is, and is with the Israelites, God's hand today is against the, the Palestinians and with, with Israel. And he just kind of went on with this. And all I could think about was like, really? Like the only day I invite this guy to come to church is when he's going to say that. So I don't even know. Probably Fadi has like never gone to church again. So that was something brand new to me. I'd grown up in the church. I'd, I'd always heard about Jesus. Uh, I was there when my dad decided to start having forums after church in this Palestinian church where we were, just to talk with the parishioners and give them room to talk about what it was like coming through a checkpoint to church that day. They were hearing messages about love your neighbor, but then the questions were, how can I love the Israeli that is like, you know, uh, that, that's, a, that, that's keeping me from getting to church, you know? and, and and so my dad would have these forums and they would talk about what is the meaning to love your neighbor, even the Israeli. And someone this week said to me, Siri, what was it like getting over all that hatred? And I, and I said to them, I, I thought for a moment, I was like, you know, in my household, we never heard anything about hatred. It was always about love your neighbor and it was always about love your enemies. And it was always about how can we be true to justice and not hate the oppressor. Like that's what it was about. So, so I grew up in that setting and now here I am for the very first time in my life hearing a, this guy say that, that God is with Israel and against the Palestinians. And so I was like, what in the world is going on? It was like such a weird thing for me. So I became exposed to what uh, I later uh, understood as Christian Zionism. And I, and I want to spend the next 15 minutes talking to you about this and then I'll open up for a few questions. So... Zionism, first of all, let's define it. And this is from the Jewish Virtual Library online. The na Zionism defined the national movement for the return of the Jewish people to their homeland and the resumption of Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel. Okay, so that's the official definition currently of Zionism. Christian Zionism is defined uh, by Colin Chapman, who, whose book I recommended last week is Christian support for Zionism that is based on theological reasons. So Christians who support the state of Israel based on the Bible. Now I would say that, I wanna just kind of expand this and say that there, what I'm about to describe to you as official, the origins of Christian Zionism is probably not, uh, cannot be articulated by, uh, by many uh, Christian Zionists, in, probably most in the US, um, but, uh, Still, there's a support, uh, maybe, maybe because of the first point. Uh, let me just go ahead and just say this. Um, ignore that top, ignore it for a second. <laughs> Ultra-literal reading of the Bible. Probably just because of that. When you read in the Old Testament and you read about Israel, and not making a separation between the Old Testament Israel and the Israel of today, uh, that's probably the main reason why most uh, 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 Christian Zionists, quote unquote, in the United States, people who support, Christians support Israel, um, believe that that is something that God is calling them to do is because of a literal reading of scriptures. But that's probably where it ends for most uh, uh, Christian Zionists. But I want to complicate it a little bit and talk about the origins of this. Can everyone say premillennial dispensationalism? <laughs> in the back, say it out loud. Thank you. Wow. If you uh, thank you. Um, if I leave here today with you just grasping the concept of this, I think we've done a lot because this is something that is 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 um, runs beneath most Christians in America, and they don't know what it is, can't articulate it, and yet the the, the belief of it. Um, influences their understanding of politics and especially uh, with Israel Palestine. So let's take it a piece by piece. Premillennialism. 
This is Edward Irving, 1792 to 1834. Um, throughout history, the majority of our history is Christians. Those who, uh, okay, let me just talk about what the millennium, millennium is, okay? Um, this is from Revelations, Revelation 20, uh, verse 4. Then I saw thrones, and those seated on them were given authority to judge. You'll see why we don't read Revelation much in church. <laughs> I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony to Jesus and for the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now, uh, for the majority of our uh, uh, religion, our faith, um, this idea of a thousand year reign of Christ has, was not that important. But those who did believe that there is such a thing, this is a, a part of a, a, a genre called um, apocalyptic genre, um, uh, uh, Revelation. So are a few other books in the scriptures. So um, uh, this idea, those who did espouse this idea of the, a thousand year reign of Christ, for the first um, 1,000 years believed they were living in it, that Jesus had come, and he inaugurated the 1,000 years. And then when you kind of hit 1,000 AD and people were waiting for the end, they realized, oh, maybe we misinterpreted it. So most Christians abandoned, those who did believe in a 1,000 year reign, abandoned the whole thing. They became amillennialists or amillennialists. There was though, with the help of Edward Irving, uh, this new thing in the 1800s, and, and, and there was, very, very, very uh, few hints of this before Irving, but he is the one that made this uh, a primary, is this idea of premillennialism, that we are living before the 100, 1,000 year reign of Christ. So that is in our future still, and everything that we see in the book of Revelation is yet to happen. Okay, so bear that in mind. Pre that's what premillennialism is. We live pre the 1,000 year reign of Christ. Dispensationalism. Also, both of these are based on a very literal reading of the Bible. There is no way that you can arrive at either of these without reading the Bible literally. Dispensationalism started with this guy, John Nelson Darby, uh, somewhere in the mid 1800s. Has anyone heard, anyone heard of John? He is uh, the founder, I think, of the Plymouth Brethren. He was an Anglican priest, uh, and then he kind of uh, was uh, ostracized because of this theology that I'm about to describe to you. So uh, Nelson Darby, he came with this idea that in the scriptures, you can, you can split the scriptures into dispensations or different time periods. And what marks a dispensation is this. God deals with humans. He gives them something to do. They fail, and then God starts a new way of dealing with humans. So the dispensations were broke out, you know, after Adam and Eve, God tells them to stay in the garden, and then they fail, and then there's a, the new dispensation. And that one is with the, the next people, you know. I, it's, it's, there's a chart for all of this. So, <laughs> so we came up with this dispensationalism. The Bible can be read and split up into all these different uh, 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 spaces where God deals with people differently, and then... God's dealing with the church is yet another dispensation. So each of those dispensations is a standalone thing. The church's dispensation applies only to the church. It doesn't apply to anything else. What God did for the church applies only to Christians and not to anyone else in the house. So um, let me just say, and I'll explain this a little bit more. John Nelson Darby started at the same time as... Um, uh, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, person, I, uh, Charles Russell, I think was his name. And they both started in England at the same time. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses didn't have much traction. There were a few. But, um, but, but, but dispensationalism became huge in America. Why? Because John Nelson Darby made a few trips to America. And during that time, he met uh, uh, C.I. Schofield. Has anyone heard of Schofield or the Schofield Bible? You've heard of school about a few more knots than, uh, than people have heard of, uh, of Darby. Okay, so Schofield was a lawyer. He became a pastor, and, he, um, and um, he is the one that took this idea of dispensationalism, and he made it 
uh, he really developed on it. And, and I just want to read you a few quotes, quotes from him. Not one instance exists of spiritual or figurative fulfillment of prophecy. Jerusalem is always Jerusalem. This is going back to the literal reading. Israel is always Israel. Zion is always Zion. Prophecies may never be spiritualized, but are always literal. Okay, this, this guy. Um, I'm glad I didn't go to his church. Um, but the idea is that those prophecies that have not been fulfilled will be fulfilled in our time. Uh, John Nelson, uh, Cyrus, uh, sorry, uh, C.I. Schofield also said this. And uh, one of the ways, and this is really uh, simplified, but I, I have to do it for time. One of the main things about these dispensations, and he added two, uh, Darby had five. This, uh, this guy added two more, so there's seven. And what he talked about is it is essential for us to separate the church from Israel. So any promises that, that God has for the church are completely separate than Israel. And Jesus, and the church didn't start until the resurrection. So anything that Jesus said about the kingdom of God or anything only referred to the kingdom of Israel. So whenever God, Jesus tells the, the disciples to pray for the kingdom, he was telling them to pray for the establishment of the the, uh, of uh, their own homeland and, and Israel, the land that, that God gave them. Uh, whoever reads the Bible, this is a quote, with any attention cannot fail to perceive that more than half of its contents relate to one nation, the Israelites. Separated from the mass of mankind, they are taken into covenant with Jehovah. And now, the other group of people, continuing his research, the student finds large mention in scripture of another distinct body, which is called the church. This body also has a peculiar relation to God and, like Israel, has received from him specific promises. But similarity ends there. So there's no idea, there's no, in his mind, um, there is no content continuation. Um, whereas we believe that Jesus came to fulfill the promise uh, that was made to Israel. And which scripture supports um, for him and for this it, through the lens of dispensationalism and, and literalistic reading, there was no thing. So I'm going to give you an example. Um, so Israel and the church seen as completely separate. Okay, here's a quick example. And I'm going to really, does everyone know the story uh, of when Jesus comes and he separates the sheep from the goats? And he says, I'm separating you. Uh, he says to one side, you come to me, you're blessed because you uh, gave people water to drink and you gave them a food to eat who are hungry and all this. So I'm fast forwarding. And then um, the group says, when uh, uh, it says to them, uh, okay, come you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. And, and they say to him, he says, I was thirsty and all this kind of stuff. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Holy. I think I missed the last one. I mean, I didn't miss it. Sorry. Um, let me. Uh, I don't. The, the the part I wanted you to see is uh, missing from this. Okay. Let me. Uh, so the way it ends is Jesus. They say to him, "When did we do this for you?" And he says, "Whatever you did to the least of these, my brothers, you did for me." Right. This is Jesus, according to Schofield, uh, speaking only about the Jewish people. So whatever you have done for the least of these, my brothers, not everyone, not his disciples necessarily only, but those who are a part of the, the Jewish covenant, then you've done it for me. So if you can just um, get a, a, a grasp a little bit for how you can make God please God by reaching out to the Jewish people. That is kind of where this whole thing started. Um, uh, there, does anyone have a question about that before I go on? This is really important, the separation, okay. Um, there are about 50 million, estimate, 50 million Christian Zionists in the US today, 50 million. And, and the population is about 314 million. So a, a sixth of the population support the state of Israel because of a theology that God's promises for the church and for Israel are, uh, are two different things. Uh, the last part I want to talk about this, I cannot believe I'm doing this so quickly. I feel almost, uh, 
like I'm offending myself doing it. <laughs> Jewish, return to, Jew, Jewish return to their homeland equals the return of Christ. Let me just end with this, and then I'll ask for questions. So the idea is that the thousand years of Christ are still to come. God has promised to the Jews that they will have that land. It doesn't matter that Jesus never mentioned anything about the land in the Bible, because the way the theology works is that anything referring to the kingdom is seen as referring to that Israel, Israel thing. This is traditional dispensationalism. People have moved beyond this. But because you still have this ultra-literal uh, reading of Scripture, the idea is that, that when all the people, are, uh, all the Jews are re returned to Israel and have that land, that will inaugurate the end times. At that point, the church's mission will end. We will be raptured, the church will be raptured, and we will receive our inheritance, which is the kingdom of heaven, right? But the, the Jewish people will remain, and, 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 and the end times will begin. There's going to be a, a tribulation that's seven years. Then um, uh, it has to start with the building of the temple. Tribulation for seven years. Jesus comes back. There's a thousand-year reign. Uh, and then uh, it's over. And then um, Jesus will reign on earth with literally with, with the Jewish people in Israel. So... Um, if you can just imagine, and the, the title for this uh, was, What Keeps This Conflict Going? Uh, from a religious standpoint, if the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, and I really do believe this, had to do with any other land other than that plot of land, the Holy Land, and it had to do with any other people other than the Jewish people, this would have gotten solved a really, really long time ago. The reason we still are stuck with this is because there are religious reasons. From a Christian standpoint, there are also Jewish religious reasons. Um, there are all kinds of religious reasons for why this is still going. Um, and I would even add that, that religiously, fundamentalist Muslims um, also have a huge part in why there's still be still a problem. So, um, it's because theologically, Israel has become the promise. If you can establish the state of Israel, then Jesus will come back. If Israel is not established, Jesus can't come back. And so our hope is Israel. Okay, let me stop there. We have, according to my watch, five minutes. So, where's I'd like to make one comment on weekends. I'd like to read a little bit of the New, New American Bible. And some time ago, I was reading there in the reading guide, and I believe it was for Revelations. And it's said in there, they no longer think these, it's going to occur like this, as apocalyptic literature, and they think the changes will be organic. What I read did not define organic. But apparently, the Catholic position is you know, it's apocalyptic literature. Yeah. Yes, thank you. This is a, a funny item, really. Um, I was driving on the Beltway sometime during the last year, and there was a beat-up old car in front of me. And I decided to pass that car, so I, I did pass it. I looked down at his uh, bumper sticker, and it said, in case of rapture, can I have your car? <laughs> First is that um, anytime I've run into um, someone, I've seen people wearing crosses and also the, um, uh, I'm sorry, it, it seems, and I, this is I guess step one of the question, is that um, often it tends to be fundamentalist Christians who are often the Christian Zionists, um, and I'm wondering if that's true, and if that is true, then two, how do they reconcile the sense of, of this, of this dispensationalism and the concept of Jews returning to the homeland being the promise, and the fact that they don't fundamentally believe that when the kingdom of God is inherited, that Jews will go to heaven because they're not Christians. So I don't understand how the, they put those two things together. Um, I, uh, I, I want to be very clear again. If you were to say the word dispensationalism to most fundamentalist Christians today, they would not know what you're talking about. 
Um, this really comes from their two school, there, there are more of them now, but um, uh, uh, Dallas Theological Seminary still teaches dispensationalism, but now they're like, they're, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a reformed kind of it. It's not so bad, you know, but, but it still is very much about the land of Israel and all that. Um, the Left Behind series, have you read the Left Behind series? Anyone, Tim LaHaye? Uh, I love Episcopalians. Can I just tell you, it's so refreshing. If you guys have not heard of these books. Um, yeah. uh, but all these books are, they are very much, uh, they continue this idea that the end times are happening, the rapture. I would say that uh, uh, most evangelical Christians uh, today who are, uh, who, who are Zionists believe for sure in the rapture. And, and even if they don't, they don't know that it's not something that the church has really espoused to, uh, except for the last 200 years, that we're going to be raptured. That's, it's taken from Thessalonians, but that has not been the way the church has understood things. Um, so uh, I, I think that um, uh, to just answer your question, most people cannot make sense of this because all they know is that when you read scripture, it talks about Israel, and it talks about um, uh, the land in the Old Testament. And, and I think it goes back to not being able to make the difference between the Israel back then and the Israel now. Um, and and I, that's why I think that uh, a huge part of this is just being able to make that separation. That people who say this conflict's been going on for 2,000 years usually are coming from this conviction that, that what God was doing in the Old Testament is still happening now, when really this is... This is a hundred year conflict. Um, so uh, I don't know if that answers your question, and We can talk more, we're running out of time. One more question, sorry, we're out of time. Why did you pick, I mean, you were in Alabama, so why did you pick the Southern Baptist Church? Was that just, that was the only place in town? Yeah, they, they, had, they had good music. Um, <laughs> and they had really lively preaching. I have to be honest with you, the reason I love to preach is because I saw that as an example. I think that you can get, the, if you can get people, okay, we'll end with this, off topic. If you can get the Episcopal Church, that people come to the Episcopal Church because of the Eucharist most of the time. Even if you have a really horrible preacher, they're gonna come to church, right? We've seen this a million times. <laughs> In evangelical and Baptist churches, people come because of the preaching. So if you're a bad preacher, people won't come to your church, okay? If you can bridge both of those together and have the Eucharist and the sacraments and have amazing preaching, that's a church that, you'll, um, that you can grow. So that's kind of my, what now? And it's to come to St. John's, according to Thank you. Thank you.